today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome Claire Waluda and Kat Waller, the duo of the British Antarctic Survey and University of Hull. They're great friends, great colleagues. They've been uh, leading a lot of research on microplastics in the Southern Ocean and surrounding uh, oceans. And it's a great privilege, not only that you accepted our invitation, but to be here. I know it hasn't been easy. You've been either in the field and hard work. So welcome to both of you. So we have the first duo of the day. Welcome to both. Am I on? Am I on? Yes. Yes. Right, so good morning, everyone. I'm Claire Valuda from the British Antarctic Survey. I'm going to do the first part of the talk, um, which is mostly on macroplastics. And then I'll hand over to Kath, who will talk a bit more about microplastics in Antarctica. Right. No. Um, it's not having it. It's probably because it's huge, isn't it? Next slide, please. Oh. Well, I can use the, the net arrow key or enter oh, yeah. Oh, it doesn't like anything. All right, hold on one second. <laughs> it's a massive file. Yeah. Which I'll do now. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so um, a brief history of plastics, as you probably know. Um, plastics didn't really exist until Bakelite was invented in 1909, made things like these telephones. After that, since the 1950s, um, the amount of plastics produced has gone exponentially, uh, increased exponentially to about 350 million metric tons in 2015. So obviously, we've gone from one type of plastic in the early 1900s to thousands of different types of plastics. And we get situations like this. The amount of waste we're generating is massive. Um, it's a global issue. We get plastic waste all over the world. It's been found in Antarctica, in the Arctic, um, uninhabited South Pacific islands. There's records of 38 million pieces of plastic on Pitcairn Island, which is... There's no people there, but all the plastic is wash, washing up there. So we're producing all this. Um, now, we think of Antarctica as a pristine environment, but is it pristine? What do we know about it? So I'll talk a little bit about our work in Antarctica. Um, as I said, I'm from Bass. We've worked um, on ecosystem monitoring for the last 30, 40 years. Um, we look at natural variability, things like climate change, um, issues from fisheries and also marine pollution. We've got two main monitoring sites. One is up at Bird Island, South Georgia, and the other is at Signal Island in the South Orkneys. But uh, the focus of the talk today is uh, Bird Island, which Jose is very familiar with. Um, it's a small island. It's about a kilometre by five kilometres at the northwest tip of South Georgia. So, up there. I've got the thing. Yeah. Um, it's, that's the base. It's a very sealy kind of place. Um, so it's basically in the middle of a seal breeding colony. Um, and someone's estimated there's 1.5 birds or seals. No, one bird or seal per one and a half metres squared of <laughs> land. So, yeah, so you get about 10 people and obviously thousands of animals. So a bit about plastics. I'll talk about plastics on beaches. Uh, the impacts on wildlife, and then I'll hand over to Kath, who will talk about microplastics. So this the base is here. And this is Main Bay. This is about 300 metres long, and this is where we do most of our monitoring work. Um, it's boulder, shingle and sand, and it's, um, yeah, there. <laughs> so the sort of stuff we get is um, things like ropes <coughs> and plastic bottle tops and just bits of sort of miscellaneous broken plastic. We also get big things like this boy, particularly like a boy with a boy. It amuses me. <laughs> um, so we survey this area monthly. 
We get between 100 and 900 items per year, and 94% of those items are plastic. So the rest of it is things like uh, rubber and fabric and metal and glass. Most of it is miscellaneous bits, so just broken bits of plastic. There's polystyrene. We get quite a lot of fisheries stuff like fishing line and nets, um, and also bottles and floats and cups. But most of it, and I think, look, I'm trying to work up this data at the moment, but my feeling is we're getting more and more small bits. So that stuff is breaking down as time goes on since the 1970s, that there's more smaller items. So that's work in progress at the minute. So to compare, yes, we get plastic in Antarctica, but compared to other parts of the world, it's it's quite small amounts, which is it's good. It's quite worrying that it's there, but it, there's not as much as there could be. So at Bird Island, it's about 0.3 items per metre. South Orkney is slightly less, 0 0.02. Compared with Svalbard, um, it's sort of around 60 items per metre squared. And then if you look at, I talked about Pitcairn before, which is down here. They're, they're estimating there's up to 27 items per, per metre per day washing up. So it's just a constant amount of plastic. So, yeah. But, it's there in Antarctica, but it's not in massive amounts. Probably one of the more obvious um, impacts of plastics is the impact on seals. So this is a fur seal at Bird Island. Um, this was, the, the, the item was removed just after that photo was taken, so all good. So what's happening is that fur seals are swimming through, they swim through items of plastic which get stuck around their necks and as they grow, the items won't come off unless we get in there and take them off for them another one um so again we've monitored since the 1980s there's over a thousand seals we've found since that time um, and the majority of juvenile males most of the items are things like packaging bands um synthetic line and fishing nets and that these are presumably discarded by the fishery and then all seals get stuck in them um, we've done some analysis on this and there is good news. Um, we suggest so since 1994 the number of entanglements have dropped quite significantly and we think this is to do with legislation. We've taken a lot of those off but also legislation has banned the disposable, disposal of packaging bands overboard. Um, we can't have, it's prohibited the use of bands on bait boxes in 1995. And now there's legislation, you have to cut the bands into 10 centimetre pieces. So what was happening was people would cut the bands and then re-knot them and then throw them over, well, they end up overboard. So all these things have reduced the amount of entanglements of Antarctic fur seals. So that's good. Um, and also we've been able to remove about three quarters of them successfully. We've got people down there who are trained in handling animals, so you wouldn't want to go too near a fur seal. And they've been able to take off quite a lot of these entanglements. Okay, so legislation plus intervention means that there's been a reduced impact on the population. So also there's an impact on seabirds. This is a wandering albatross that swallowed a hook with a line on it. This was highlighted quite uh, vividly in Blue Planet 2 the last couple of years, which um, featured Bird Island albatross and the story about plastics that they were ingesting. So what we think is the plastic items are ingested by seabirds as they're foraging and they accidentally mistake these for food items. And then they bring them back to their nest and feed them for their chicks. Um, the most heavily affected species of the albatross, these are the birds that forage long distances, particularly wandering albatrosses, also grey-headed and black brows. Um, they, they go a long, a long way out and bring back the plastic for the chicks. There's small amounts of um, plastic associated with other species, but it's, it's minor compared to the albatross. Um, this is the sort of stuff we find. I keep showing this slide, but my favourite thing there is there's a pencil sharpener. I'm not wearing really wearing that school. Cool. <laughs> um, again, majority of plastic, 91%. 
um, things like fishing line and hooks, plastic bags, bottle tops, jigs, and again, miscellaneous broken bits of plastic. So as I say, these are collected by the adults, brought back to the chicks as part of the food. It's obviously not food. Um, it's likely that a lot of this stuff comes from, the, the birds forage a long way away from the, the colonies, so it's likely that they're bringing this in from, from far beyond the Antarctic. So th this shows um, the foraging distribution of a black-browed albatross. So it looks like it, it might be collecting plastic from elsewhere, bringing it back to Bird Island. Yeah. Okay, so um, just to summarise what I've said about macroplastics, there's persistent low levels. We've found those since the 1980s. There's records of entangled seals from the mid 70s, early 70s. So it's been there a long time. There's threats to wildlife, but a lot of the work we're doing is, is able to mitigate some of that. Um, and the legislation that's been put in place has been effective to a point. Um, we think that the plastic is originating. Some of it comes from the Antarctic region, the Southern Ocean, but a lot of it is probably coming from outside. So the, the next thing to look at is microplastics, um, which is, you know, it's kind of a, a hot topic at the minute. And we're starting to understand what's going on in the Antarctic about microplastics. But Kath is going to talk to you about that. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Am I switched on? Yeah? In front of that mic. In yeah. front of the mic. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so uh, really nice to be here. Thanks, Jose, for inviting me. We had a little bit of a trauma in that uh, I got a bit ill on South Georgia and I didn't think I was going to be here to, to present for you, but I am. I'm here. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, just a little. Um, I'm interested in microplastics, uh, particularly in the polar region. So I call myself an environmental ecologist. I'm interested in how animals, particularly I like playing on beaches, so sort of near shore waters, intertidal stuff, stuff that you can take your students out to look at, how microplastic pollution is affecting these things, because a lot of them are filter feeders, they'll, they'll suck the plastics in. So uh, I just want to talk about a little bit of work I've done with Claire and various other people at British Antarctic Survey and colleagues in Peru about how we estimated how much plastic was in Antarctic waters and then a little bit about uh, um, what we know about how it could possibly get there. So Claire has already alluded to the fact that there's quite a lot of macro plastics being washed up on Bird Island and other islands. So I've been to a number of other islands and seen a lot of plastic um, sort of rubbish left on the beaches. There are two sources of microplastics. So there's a source that originates as a microplastic, so it's never been anything else. Now you can get it in exfoliating beads, in um, personal grooming products, things like toothpaste, shampoo. Although in the UK they have been banned. I'm not sure about the States. I think they've banned them in the States as well. So but that's probably less of a problem now. The other sort of source of these micro uh, plastics are microfibers that come out of fleeces and things like that. So somebody estimated that a normal six kilogram wash of um, synthetic fibers would give you about six billion fibers coming out of your washing machine and into the uh, into the sort of freshwater environment and from there into the marine environment. So you've got these two different sorts of uh, microplastics. Most of what we're seeing that I have found in Antarctica are these secondary microplastics. So the things that are broken down from bigger products like plastic bottles, fishing line, that sort of thing. Um, so I started thinking about microplastics. I'd been to an island called Livingston Island, which is uh, in the South Sandwich Islands, so it's the top of the peninsula. And I said to colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey, I'm going to work out how much microplastics I think are going into um, Antarctic marine waters based on the number of scientists that go down there, the number of cruise ships, the number of uh, fishing vessels, all these data, all these uh, figures and values you can, you can find from the literature and find from uh, various um, sort of web sources. And we calculated how much microplastic load we thought would be going into Antarctica from all the cruise ships that go down, from bases, shipping. Uh, and when we looked at the few studies that we could find that had actually measured microplastics in the surface waters. Our estimate of what should be in there was five orders of magnitude 
lower than we were finding. That's not five times, that's 100,000 times lower than what was actually in the water. So that sort of begs the question, where is it coming from? And that's one of the things that we still don't really have a, a good understanding of. So if you're thinking about, I like to think plastics as like the plastic cycle. So we use plastics, we put them into um, landfill, they can get blown out, they can get washed out. They can end up coming down through the rivers, they enter the ocean, they get uh, perturbed, they get brittle with the UV, they break down. Birds, as Claire was showing, can um, forage for them and pick pieces up. And when they start to break down, then they start to drop down into the deeper waters and you get into the pelagic, so the, the, the sort of um, the, the mid-water food web, and eventually they get down to the ocean floor and the stuff that lives on the ocean floor is affected. Um, so we know, we've got an idea of how it moves through the marine environment, but we don't really know how it breaks down. So we don't really know how UV, how quickly the sun breaks down these plastics. We don't really understand the um, chemical sort of decay of these plastics. It's been suggested that when they start breaking down, they give off chemicals that actually appeal to certain fish species and potentially krill. So as they break down, it seems that some of them could be actually tasty and, and these marine animals are ingesting them because they think the food, because the, 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 the smell, the taste that they get through the water is appealing. And we don't really have a lot of idea about how this biological food web accumulates plastic. So we don't really know whether it's biomagnified up through the food chain or not. So all these things, uh, Claire, myself and various other people, both at Hull, Bass and, and other institutions are starting to try and look at this as a holistic mm -hmm. thing. How does plastic affect sort of the whole marine food web? Um, the Antarctic food web is quite is quite short in terms of this is a bit krill centric for me. Claire Claire likes it, but um, I work on the benthos, so you know I just had to add that in. But what what you see from this is that you have a few key species, particularly in the pelagic realm, like krill, that, that lots and lots of big charismatic uh, animals feed on. So you've got very very short food chains, and if the krill is perturbed. If krill ingest it and it damages krill, then you don't have a lot of resilience in those food webs. You don't have a lot of other things that they could eat. So the worry with what's happening in Antarctica is that because these food webs are, are, are quite fragile, that if we're going to have a big impact from plastics on one key species, it could have quite a, a significant knock-on effect for for other things that people like to look at, like the whales and the seals and the pretty things that, that we all love to see on, on Blue Planet. Um, I'm just going to show you a little video. I hope it works. Let's try it. So I work on the seabed. So this is the seabed. This is about 300 metres deep. I normally walk, work a little bit shallower, but everything you are seeing in this video, all these things here are filter feeders, uh, apart from the little isopod that's sitting on there. But the Seabed around Antarctica is covered in things that feed by filtering particles out of the water. Um, so you can see all this grey gloop on the sponge and the grey gloop behind the octopus. I know you're all looking at the octopus. Um, but all this grey gloop is marine snow. It's stuff that's fallen down through the water column and ends up on the seabed. And that's what these filter feeders uh, use as food. Now, in that marine snow, we don't know how many particles of plastic are filtering down and ending up in the seabed. We know that it's there because some people have done a little bit of work showing that they have found microplastics in, in deep sea sediments. Uh, so what you can see is we've got really, really rich ecosystems on the seabed and every one of those animals that you can see there is a filter feeder. So every one of those animals there is potentially going to be affected by, by the microplastics in the system. Okay. Um, if you're interested, we have created a database. So this is a freely available database. It's um, available, by the, available from the Southern Ocean Observing uh, System. And it's got all the data from every study that we could find about micro and macroplastics, where they were found, what they were, 
where the paper is that we've taken the data from. So if you're wanting to use this as a resource, you know, if you're thinking about getting your students to think about it, that's freely available and the, the link's on there. And I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if you're going to be sharing the presentations so you can, you can take it from there. Um, also, as a result of what we've done, um, we have produced a paper for non-scientific people, um, and that is on the Antarctic Environments Portal. So again, you can go and find that. Uh, we've summarised what we know about plastics, uh, the earliest reports being in 2009. These are microplastics. Uh, and if you want a sort of less technical than the, the, the scientific paper read, then um, it's freely available there. We're hoping to present these results to the Antra Antarctic Treaty um, Committee for Environmental Protection this year with the hope that they will um, perhaps legislate about putting filters on washing machines so that you, you, you know, to reduce the amount of plastics going in. So that's going in front of the, of the treaty this, this June. Um, I'm running a little bit over, but I've nearly finished. Um, the ecological implications I've sort of talked about a little bit. Um, there has been one study done on krill, Southern Ocean krill, and they have found that um, if you feed krill microplastics and then look at what they poop out, they poop out nanoplastics. So they're doing something inside of themselves. They're digesting it and, and obviously changing the, the, the plastic bead into something smaller. We have no idea whether that's going to affect their reproduction or their growth rate or any of the other sort of um, ecological traits, um, you know, that for, for the living. Just to sort of, I don't like scaring people, just to sort of bring it home a little bit more. 25% of all the krill in the Southern Ocean is found around uh, South Georgia. So uh, the hot spots on the bottom uh, map there, the reds show where you're getting most of the krill. And as you can see, it's round and about South Georgia. If you look at um, the map on the top left, um, that shows where most of the shipping is. And again, you're getting most of the krill in the areas where you're getting most of the uh, human impact. And you're also finding that that area as well is the fastest warming bit of Antarctica. So 25% of the krill are in an area where we're getting lots and lots of anthropogenic um, activity and lots of potentially input of plastics. And we've also got the added stressor that we're seeing a warming ocean around there. So we we really need to get a handle on what we, what's happening in, in these food webs. Um, I thought I'd put some seals and you've had some great pictures from Claire, so I thought I'd put some in. But what you've got to remember is these these guys, these um, fur, elephant seals, birds, penguins are the top of this food chain. And, you know, we, we, we need to understand how the effects on krill and other, other plankton uh, species are going to affect these things. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a penguin colony. It's Big Mackler. So every one of those little dots you see there's a penguin. Um, and penguins go out forage and, you know, <coughs> eat these potentially um, uh, sort of um, contaminated items of prey. So finally, um, where's it coming from? We got five orders of magnitude. We got 100,000 times higher than we anticipated when we when we did our calculations and looked at the few records that we've got of, of what's what's out there. So this is some work done by Craig Fraser uh, from Australia, and it's based on a piece of kelp that she found on South Georgia. So the dot where the blue and the yellow is is South Georgia. She's done DNA work on kelp, so she could match this kelp. And um, it started from South Georgia, but she found it on mm, she found it on one of the uh, islands down, oh, what have I done? <laughs> Did start, is that it? So Craig found it on one of these islands down here, but she knew it started from South Georgia because the DNA said that it, it matched the, 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 the signal from up there. So she basically modeled what would happen if you released kelp or particles, this could be plastic or anything, from South Georgia. So the blue ones 
are the ones that are going to get spit out and don't get to the Antarctica, but the yellow ones are going to eventually make it. So what you're seeing here is how long it's taking. So it's gone around a whole year. This is the um, Antarctic circumpolar current and the, the, the currents in the subpolar front. And what you see is that two years after this set off from South Georgia, these guys are sort of hitting the continent down here. And then eventually a big bunch of these is going to make landfall down on the peninsula. So things that can float around for a long time in the Southern Ocean mm. potentially will make it from you know, quite a long way away to, to Antarctica. And of course, a lot of plastic floats. So what we need to do next is, you know, try and try and do some modeling. And I think that's something that, uh, that Bass is, is, is currently um, working on, is modeling how these plastics might move around and enter into um, the Southern Ocean. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too much because I'm really conscious that I'm a little bit over, but I have collected some samples from the other pole, from Greenland, um, and I had a couple of students working on this, and we found uh, microplastics in every beach sediment that we looked at in Greenland um, at levels that were as high as places like China and things like that, really high levels. And we also found them in every specimen, every, uh, every group of intertidal mussels that we sampled, we found microplastics in those as well. And Greenland's got a population of something like 50,000, so it's, it's quite a sparsely populated um, um, island. So again, we suspect that a lot of what we're seeing here is our problem in Europe. Stuff that we've somehow discarded is ending up getting up into the Arctic. So it's, it's a problem for both poles, not just the Antarctic. Um, so what can we do about it? It's very difficult. Um, we can all play our own individual part. And as educators, you know, as uh, I love going out and um, teaching the kids and talking to the kids. And they, I've always found they're very open to, uh, you know, not using single plastic, single use plastics, things like that. We can all take our part in doing that. But it's such a massive problem. And you've got to remember that plastic, you know, a plastic bottle will last 450 years, at least in the marine environment. There does need to be, you know, some sort of standardized um, approach, I think, that is not just on a countrywide approach, but perhaps a worldwide, you know, maybe maybe it's a new ozone hole and the UN should do something about it. I don't know. But what we're doing in Antarctica is we've set up an, set up an action group. So it's a plastics action group, which we've got researchers from all over the world who are participating. We are trying to standardize the way the approach we take to monitoring both macroplastics and microplastics in Antarctica because a lot of the problem we've got at the moment with comparing things is that people do things in different ways and they're not directly comparable so you can't get a relative idea of how bad the problem is because there's so many different ways of measuring things so we're trying to get people to go out from their bases you can Playing on the beach is great. It's easy, quick. You can do it if the weather's really bad. So we're trying to get um, all the bases to monitor, to go out and monitor for macro and microplastics and to do it in the same way so that we can produce uh, a definitive answer to what's there. And then once we do that, then we're in a better position to say what are the impacts on these, um, these quite fragile ecosystems. Um, so we've got an action group. We're running a, a, a conference, a workshop, probably in October now, um, somewhere in the UK. So again, if you're interested, um, it'll all be on the SCAR um, website and the links down there at the bottom. Um, but I just think if we could all, you know, do our bit, and I think it's really important um, as educators to try and get the younger generation to to really buy into um you know, dealing with plastics. But I do think it's it's, it's a, a very big problem that we need not just us and the people we can influence, but, you know, it needs to be looked at. We can do a lot about single-use plastics and make our choices in the supermarket, but, you know, there needs to be a bigger approach as well. And hopefully the, the stuff we're doing in Antarctica will start to, you know, 
to be one of the pieces in that sort of global jigsaw. So that's um, all I've got to say. Thank you for listening. And Claire, do you want to tell me what these are now? We're we doing some science labs. Oh, yeah. So, program, but, um, Never mind. Yeah. Um, so we've got three science labs, as it says on the program. We've got three of our fantastic students presenting different items. I think you can do two of those, can you? Yes. yes. We've, we've signed up. Oh, we've signed up. Okay. So we've got one on um, plastic on ice, one on microplastics and how you can um, approach that in a citizen science kind of way, and then one on plastic in the polar food webs. So yeah. that's next. You said it so quickly. So I, I just wanted to say before we start, it's amazing again that we've got three wonderful young researchers who are actually actively researching these areas. And we'll tell you a bit more and show you a bit more about how they're doing it and playing their part in this. Um, so the, the people who are doing classic on ice uh, for this session um, would be staying here in the theatre. So that's Jose, Jaswant, uh, Ram, can't read the next one, Anya, Yuichi, or getting better though, aren't I? Marcus, Clemens, Jenny, Gerlis and Vicky. Um, the people who are heading to the Lloyd room for the citizen science side of things with is Vicky here? Kirsty here, sorry. Uh, do you want to come down and collect your people and <laughs> um, 